Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Alhamdulillahillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman katsiran katsira. Amma ba'du. My brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah. This is the 31st of uh, December 2019. So this is the last day and last night of this year. and uh, tomorrow will be the first of 2020 and alhamdulillah bi idnillah ta'ala instead of uh, jiving somewhere and uh, singing all lang sign we are sitting here in the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalahu alhamdulillah the lots of the new year greetings and new year celebrations which are happening all over the world the thing which i remind myself and you is that celebration can be and should be for achievement what the turn of the year simply means that this planet made a full circle around the star which is the sun that's it i mean what did i have to do with that what did you have to do with that you could neither stop it nor nor could we make it go faster or slower so if i'm saying i'm celebrating what are you celebrating celebration has to be for some achievements i i am i can celebrate the fact that i climbed a mountain or i can celebrate the fact that um uh, you know i did a passed a difficult exam or i can celebrate something where i had some contribution in that so first question to ask is really what are we celebrating but what we can and should do and i usually say this also with regard to both this because we celebrate both this right and if you ask yourself what is it you are celebrating that you are one year closer to your death i mean is that something to celebrate because that's all that's all it means it just means that i was 63 and i'm 64 so i'm now one year closer to my death and is that something to celebrate what what do you celebrate whereas what can be done and should be done is to reflect and to take stock of what we did how did we spend this year so the last year which went 2019 how did i personally spend this year what could i have done what did i actually do and if i could do something and i did it alhamdulillah if i do, could do something i did more alhamdulillah but if i could do something and i did not do enough then i need to ask myself and say what is it that prevented me from contributing more than i actually contributed i could have done i could have done so much more so it's it's, it's not always necessary that it's bad news it can be good news as well so alhamdulillah this is what i achieved which is good but i'm saying what is required is thoughtful reflection about our lives and the big the big benefit of that is that it helps us then to plan the coming period which is the next year so if i have a if i do thoughtful reflection on my current year which has gone has gone past and i say this year this is what i did uh this is what i could have done uh, here is the shortfall here is the surplus and so forth he said now therefore in the coming year uh which starts from tomorrow what can i do to make that a better year than the one that went past we have the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where he said that if two days are equal then you wasted one day now imagine the standard that is set by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is uh, is amazing just two days literally he says if two of your days are equal then one day has been wasted may allah give us the tawfiq to use our time uh, productively and in a way which is beneficial for us so what about if if two years are equal so it's something that we need to plan and that's what i remind myself with you let us use the time that we have uh, in a way which is inshallah beneficial for us the most important thing to remind ourselves in all of this and all the plans and so on and so forth and we need to strategize we need to plan whether it is our career whether it is our family whether it is the raising of our children uh, whether it is our marital relationships uh, whether it is uh, thinking about and worrying about the future of us as an ummah because again this is part of being a member of the muslim ummah nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this ummah is like one body if the head pains the whole body knows that 
In another hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the one who is not interested in the welfare of our Ummah is not from us. The one who does not worry about this is not from us. So Alhamdulillah, we have feeling for this. We, we uh, you know, in our hearts, we have feeling for people. We have feeling for the Ummah. Thing to do is to now, what, therefore, what must I do? Just having the feeling by itself is one thing. Somebody sent me the other day a uh, very nice video of Toronto in, uh, in Canada where uh, there is... It, it looked like a, either an RV or a, or, or a, a you know a sort of caravan kind of a thing, uh, which goes uh, not, which goes uh, through the streets and they pick up homeless people sleeping on on pavements and on park benches and so on, and they take them in and they give them a hot meal and they give them a place to rest. Sure, it doesn't solve the problem of that person forever, but it solves it for at least one day. Right? Now, uh, usual question, we say, well, have you ever slept on the pavement? Have you ever slept on a park bench? Uh, so even you might even get you know, charged up and say, okay, I'm going to try and do that. I want, to f I want to know what a homeless person feels when he or she is sleeping on the pavement or they are sleeping on the park bench. But my submission to you is, you will never know that because you are doing that voluntarily you are doing that deliberately they have no choice right it's not a matter of physically spending a night on a park bench we do that for fun not on a park bench but when we go camping for example you're doing it for fun but the homeless person is doing it because they have no choice what does that insecurity feel how do you know that you, you will never know that may Allah keep you like that may you never know that but I'm saying that we need to have that compassion in our heart here is a person who is not doing it for fun. They are doing it because they have no choice. What does that insecurity feel like? Right? What does that insecurity feel like? This is the meaning of being a Muslim, which is to feel for somebody else. Whoever that person might be, it's immaterial. Whether that person is Muslim, not Muslim, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbul Alameen. He is not Rabbul Muslimin. This is, the, this is the beauty and the universality of this deen. Our, our Rabb, the one we worship is Rabbul Alameen. The, the messenger we follow is Rahmatul Lil Alameen. Not Rahmatul Lil Muslimin. The kitab that we follow, the book, Hudal Lil Nas. That's for everybody. It's not Hudal Lil Muslimin. No. Hudal Lil Nas. Yes, Hudal Lil Muttaqeen. We, we know that that is a Another aspect of the Quran, but Khudal Nas, it is Hidayah for everybody, for all of Nas. Kuntum khaira ummati nukhrijat lin Nas. For this Ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you are the best of people and you have been selected for the benefit of all the people. Nukhrijat yeah? lin Muslimi, no. Nukhrijat lin Nas. So if I, have, if I as a Muslim am not thinking about the benefit of the whole world, then something is wrong with my understanding of myself and my understanding of my own religion. This is what we need to do. And then it is not sufficient only to think. It's not as if we have only one head which thinks and the rest of the body is made of wood. No. The thought must translate into action. It's only in the, in, in the action that the glory of thought manifests itself. Otherwise empty thought is, is what? What's the point of that thought? We need the thought. Without action, without thought, this is, you know, it, it is a recipe for disaster. But, but similarly, only thought without action has no point. So we need thought and we need action. And this whole thing must be supervised, mentally speaking, and guided by the deen of Islam. This is what keeps us on track. It is the boundary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalaluhu and the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah which keeps us on track. We were talking as we were coming up uh, from my place, uh, Asad and me, we were talking about how we said, how, how is it that people, uh, you, you hear people making speeches after they have retired. I've, I've seen this so many times, right? So uh, the person was in a high position. Uh, in government, in political power and authority and whatnot, uh, and they did whatever they did. 
And after they retire, then you have them making speeches and saying, you know, the thing I did there, I really shouldn't have done it. Uh, I regret having done that. And my point is big deal. I mean, you destroyed the world, right? So now you want to say, I, I'm sorry. So who cares? You're sorry. You know, put it by the sun doesn't shine. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that, that thing has no meaning. Now, question is, simple question to ask is, did that person not know that what they were doing was wrong? I mean, that's a no-brainer. There's no way that those people did not know that what they were doing was wrong. They knew it. <coughs> then why did they do that? Because there is no guidance of Islam. There is no concept of accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives, as I was saying the other day, this, the, it gives two very major benefits to the person. The knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu is seeing, he is watching, he is listening, he knows, he is aware. Ali mumbi dhati sudur, sami'ul basir. The awareness that this is there. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ قَالَ جَلَّ وَعَلَى This awareness does two very major things for us. The first one is that this is protection from sin. If I know that Allah is watching, then how can I tell a lie? How can I do ghibah? How can I kill somebody? How can I, how can I cheat? How can I steal? How can I do it? If I am aware, if I am aware, the whole point is that. If I am aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me, listening to me, is with me. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you are alone, he is the, he is the second. If there are two, he is the third. So when we have this understanding, then this is protection. This is the great shield. Protection from sin. And the second big benefit is that this awareness is the greatest source of confidence for the individual. How and why would you be afraid if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you? You cannot be afraid. And you cannot be afraid. I was in India, in North India once and we were in some place and we had to get back in the night. Uh, and one of my, one of my friends is a senior, was a senior police officer at the time there. So he said, I will give you an escort. I said, I don't need an escort. I, he said, no, 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 this, this, these roads are not safe. There are highway robbers and stuff, so I'll give you an escort. What that escort turned out to be was we had a police jeep behind us and we had a police jeep in front of us and we were driving in the middle. Right? So now my point is, how safe do you feel? Right? You've got armed guards behind you, in front of you. And you say, Alhamdulillah, this is fine, fantastic. No one will stop this convoy because it is guarded front and back. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What sense of awareness of Allah do we have? He said, wa wa ma kuntum. What, is the, what is the awareness of that in our heart? That Allah is with me, alhamdulillah. I don't need anybody else. Why am I afraid? So this awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what keeps us on track. So no matter how much of power, wealth, authority, what not, what not you have, the one who is aware knows that one day I have to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day I have to go and answer to Allah for whatever I am doing. So let me make sure that I do the right things here. Let me make sure that I take the right decisions. Many times you have this thing. People say, oh, but you know, after all, that person had this uh, problem and that person had this imperative and so on. But my point is, everybody's got an excuse. Everybody has an excuse. Rasulullah had excuses. For example, the people came from Taif. You know the whole story of Taif. I don't have to tell you that. He went to Taif and they rejected him and so on and so on. And the one, finally, when he, after Hijra, when he went to Medina before Fatah Makkah, the uh, Banu Zakhi from Taif, they came as a delegation and they said, we will accept Islam. We will say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We will accept you as the Nabi. We will pray, but we will not give zakat. And there were people at the time who advised it. They said, Ya Rasulullah, this is a good thing. We have no supporters. We have nobody with us. This is one of the two big tribes of the Hejaz. One is the Quraysh, one is the Banu Taqif. This is these people they want. Hey, they, will, they will turn around. They will come around. Inshallah, they are not paying like this. They are saying we won't pay zakat now. Later on, they will pay and so on and so on and so forth. What was Nabi Wasallam's reaction to that? He said, the one who separates the Salah from the Zakat is not a Muslim. 
He said, I will not accept the Islam. And this was the ruling of the Nabi alayhi salam, which Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq used in his time when there were the, uh, the wars of Ridda, when people said that we will not pay zakat, Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, if you don't pay zakat, I will fight you. None less than Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab He said to him, are you going to fight Muslims? He said, Nabi sallallahu alayhi said this, the one who separates the salah from the zakat is not a Muslim. I am not fighting Muslims. If they refuse to pay zakat, I will fight them. Rasulullah took a stand. Abu Bakr Siddiq took a stand. He didn't say, oh, but you know, times are like this. No, 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 no. The whole point of a principle is that you take a stand on that principle. It's not a question of times, this, that. The issue is, we forget. And, this, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because this comes back again to Wahwa Ma'aku Ma'ina we forget the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. The role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. And the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is one thing about, about the, this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help does not come until you let go. This is the sunnah of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not show his help in advance. The whole issue is Iman bil ghaib. If you believe that Allah is with you, then you act in that way. Then the help of Allah will come. Hmm? Take Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is tied up, trussed up, and he is put into the the cup of the trebuchet, the catapult, they have made a fire which is so huge that they need a siege engine to throw him into the fire. They can't, uh, they can't go close to the fire. So they have put him in this thing. Ibrahim is sitting there. Where is the help of Allah? Do you see any signs of the help of Allah? No signs. And then in one narration, Jibreel a.s. comes to Ibrahim a.s. And Jibreel a.s. says, Ya Khalilullah, tell me what do you want me to do? Can I help you? Tell me what do you want from me? Ibrahim a.s. says, I ask only Allah. I don't need anything from you. So Jibreel a.s. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all this. Jibreel is a malak. He does not go unless Allah sends him. So Jibreel a.s. goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbal Alameen, your Khalil is about to be burnt. I went to him, I asked him, can I help you? He says, he's not accepting anything from me. What shall I do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you go and you tell him that I have sent you. And I want to know what does he want from me. Jibreel Islam goes back, he says, Allah has sent me. Your Rabb wants to know what you want from him. Ibrahim alayhi salam says, I want whatever my Rabb wants. My Rabb does not need to ask this question. Huh? He doesn't say, save me from the fire. No. I want whatever my Rabb Jalla Jalla who wants. When Ibrahim alayhi salam removed the means, when he removed the tawassul, when he removed the wasila from between him and his Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly ordered the fire. Kulna ya nar kuni bardan was salam ala Ibrahim. Allah did not then, Allah did not tell Jibreel Islam to do anything. No. Allah did not tell Jibreel alayhi salam to do anything. He said, No. My slave and me. Iya ka na'abudu wa iya ka nasta'in. What is the reply for that? The hadith of the Response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Surah Al-Fatiha. You all know this hadith. What is the response of Iyaka Nabudu Iyaka Nastain? Allah says, now it is between me and my slave. Whatever he wants, I will give him. O oh Allah, we worship only you. We ask only from you, nobody else. And Allah says, then I will give. This is the power of Awareness. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. Right? There's a very nice teaching story. It's not a true story, but it's a good story to, you know, to illustrate. The story is that this man is a mountain climber and he wants to climb this particular mountain and he wants to go up a particular phase, which is the most dangerous phase of that mountain. So he plans for this for many years. He prepares himself. He has all his equipment and everything else. And then he goes to the base camp and he is about to start climbing. But at that time, the weather changes. So people advise him, they say, no, don't climb today, you know, wait for some time. Uh, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, maybe weather, weather will improve. But he says, no, I have no time. I have just this window and I am going to go. So against everybody's advice, the man starts climbing the mountain. And as he is climbing, the weather becomes worse and worse and worse. And he is now halfway up or three quarters of the way up. And the weather, now it's become pitch dark. And there is a gale force wind and the guy is stuck and he can neither go up nor come down. And at that point, he slips and falls. He is alone. He slips and falls. So now imagine it is pitch dark. He can't see anything. There is this wind and he is dropping. He is in free fall. So in his mind now, in an instant, his whole life is playing back. And he knows he is finished. This is, this is it. Khatam. I mean, I am going to... Hit the ground and I'm dead. And at that time, his rope, which he is climbing with, that rope snags. And he is brought up like that. Tuck. He is held. So now he is like a pendulum. He is swinging in midair. But he hasn't hit the ground. So the man now tries to look around. He can't see anything. It is totally dark. So the man says, oh God, save me. Spontaneously, he said, oh God, save me. So he hears a voice. And the voice says, do you think I can save you? The man says, wallahi, this is, you know. He said, yes, only you can save me. Nobody can save me. Save me, please save me. So the voice says, are you sure that I can save you? The man says, yes, absolutely. No one can save me. Please save me. The voice says, then cut the rope. <laughs> eh? Says, then cut the rope. <clears throat> you know, all climbers and all, they have, a, they have a knife. He has a knife. Says, then cut the rope. And they say that next morning, search parties went out because they knew this guy had gone out and so on and so forth. They found this guy holding his rope with both his hands, frozen to death, four feet from the ground. Hmm? Cut the rope. The sign of tawakkul is to cut the rope. Please understand, cut the rope does not mean leave the dunya. No, Allah sent us into this dunya to live. Cut the rope is in the heart. It is the rope in the heart which needs to be cut. Doesn't mean shut your shop and you know, leave your job. No, 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 no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to, to prosper. Allah wants you to be wealthy. Allah wants you to be powerful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to have influence so that you can do good. What is the good if all of us become homeless and we sleep on the street? Who are you going to help? Nobody. You can't even help yourself. Cut the rope is in the heart. I always think to myself, whenever I come to America or Canada or something, the richest, most wealthiest countries in the world, why are people sleeping on the street? The place where they are sleeping on the street, I was in Jamaat, I was in a Paidal Jamaat in New York, and uh, very early in the morning once we were going down Mayfair, and we see garbage everywhere, on the pavement, on the street, strewn, garbage everywhere. So I asked uh, a couple of uh, brothers were with, with me. I said, what is this thing? I mean, this is the, probably one of the most, if not the most expensive neighborhood in, uh, in New York. That you've got, a, I think uh, there, there's probably no apartment there that's less than a million dollars. Million dollars is probably, you know, a base figure. 
But there's so much of garbage. And why is this place so dirty? He says, no, this is not from them. He said, this garbage is on the street because of the people who live in the subway tunnels. I said, people live in subway tunnels? He said, yeah. He said, they live in the subway tunnels because the subway tunnels are heated. I said, what about the uh, track which is electrified? What happens if you touch the track? He said, Psst. That's it. You touch the track, you're gone. So if you're sleeping, your hand touches the track, that's it, khalas, you're gone. But he says, the subway is heated, so in the, in the winter. So I said, what about the garbage? He said, the most expensive place has the best garbage. Yeah? He said, the most expensive place has the best garbage. People throw away good stuff. So people come here to eat from the garbage cans. Why? Is it lack of resources or is it lack of compassion? If it was lack of resources, there would be no garbage because people, they would eat it. This is what Islam came to teach us. Islam came to teach us compassion. Simply just, the, I'm giving you just some examples. If we take the sum total of time, energy and money that goes into watching games, whether it's soccer or cricket or football or basketball or baseball, sum total of the money, the time and the energy. And if we take this and we put it into poverty alleviation, removing of poverty, Believe me, take my word for it. There will not be a single poor person. There will not be a single person sleeping on the street. There will not be a single person who has to go to bed hungry. And you will still have money left. But we spend that money watching ball games while there are people starving on the street. And then we want to blame God and say, oh, but why doesn't God do anything? People ask this question, no? People ask this question. I say God did something. He created you. You are the one not doing what you are supposed to do. Don't blame God for it. Allah created you. For what? He created you. He gave you a deed. He gave you understanding and so on and so forth. He gave you ideas. If you can walk by, if you can drive by somebody sleeping on the street and you can go home and you can sleep peacefully in your bed, my brothers and sisters, believe me, there is something wrong with your heart. There is something seriously wrong with your heart. This is not Islam. Islam didn't come to kill our hearts. Islam came to keep them alive. That is the whole the whole issue. This this uh, uh, the course which is uh, you know the uh, living Islam is about this. Living Islam is about practicing of Islam in our lives. That's why Abu Hurairah of the Ranu, in this hadith in Muslim, he reported, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, I am just as my slave thinks of me when he remembers me. And I inda zanni abdi bi. He said, I am as my slave thinks of me. And that is the reason why Rasulullah said, have the best of opinions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah said, I am as my slave expects me to be. And then he said, Nabi Sallallahu said, by Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more pleased with the repentance, with the istighfar and tawbah of his slave than one of you who unexpectedly finds in the desert that he has lost his camel. Hmm? What is the meaning of losing your camel? This is not an academic thing. If you are traveling in the desert, your camel is your lifeline. If you lose your camel, you are as good as dead because that camel has your food on it, it has your resources on it, that's your transportation. If that camel goes away somewhere, then you are as good as finished. In one hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there was, there was this man, he uh, 
uh, was traveling on his camel. He stopped somewhere and he was resting or something and this camel disappeared. He said the man gave up. He decided that I am going to die because there is no way I can survive. I will die. So he sat down there and in the process somehow he just fell asleep. And when he woke up, he found the camel standing there next to him. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the man was so happy hmm, that instead of uh, he, 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 the way he thanked Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, he reversed the words. Uh, instead of saying, "Oh Allah, I am grateful to you," he said, "Yeah, Allah is grateful to me." Or you know, say this way, he kind of reversed. He was so like like he was crazy with happiness. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the example and he said, this is how happy Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala becomes and is when a slave repents. Now when I, when I heard this hadith, I was thinking to myself, why is Allah concerned about it? Why is he so happy? For what? So I don't repent, I go into Jahannam. So what? Jahannam is made, no? He's gone to burn somebody. And my understanding is the reason Allah repents is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The famous hadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa saw this lady who was nursing her child. This lady was one of the people who was a prisoner of war and she lost her child in the, in the whole melee. Uh, and then suddenly she found the child. So she grabbed the child and hugged the child and kissed the child and she started nursing the small baby. So she started nursing the child. And that time Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi passed by and he said to the Sahaba, he said, tell me, do you think this woman will throw that baby into the fire? Yes, Ya Rasulullah, impossible. How can this mother, it's her child, she's nursing the child, she's so happy to find the child. And of course, she can't throw this child into the fire. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loves you 70 times more than that. 70 times more than that. Sufyan al Tauri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he is dying his last moments in life. He is lying on his bed, his friend comes and sits with him, and his friend says, Ya Sufyan, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a choice, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you meet Allah, if Allah gives you a choice, and if Allah says, Tell me, if you want, I will ask your mother to take your hisab. Right? They are counting before Allah. So if say Allah gives me a choice to say, if Allah gives you a choice to say, if you want, I will uh, I will allow your mother to take your hisab or I will take your hisab. Which one do you want? So Sufyan Sauri Rahmatullah, he said, I will tell Allah, Ya Allah, you take my hisab. Not my mother. So his friend said, this is a strange thing. Your mother takes your hisab instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want your mother to take your hisab? He said, no. So his friend says, why? He says, because Allah's love is 70 times more than the love of my mother. So I want Allah to take my Not my mother. This is the issue of istighfar al tawbah So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, He who comes closer to me by one span. One span is this much. Yeah? The, from, if you take your hand like this. He said, he comes to me, close to me by one span. I come close to him by one cubit. And he who comes closer to me by a cubit, I come closer to him by a fathom. A fathom is about six feet. And then he said, if he comes to me walking, I come to him running. Hmm? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ بَلِّلَّهِ Allah said, who are the believers? He said, they are the ones who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anyone or anything else. I remind myself and you, how do we love Allah? How can we develop this love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this as our distinguishing feature. So if somebody says, who is a believer? You say, the one who loves Allah. This is, what Allah, this, is what Allah, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Walladina aman wa shadu billah. So who is a believer? The one who loves Allah. And how do you know if somebody loves Allah? 
because the love of Allah is expressed in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience to Allah. For which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of every aspect of that believer's life. This is the reason why we are Ibadullah. We are the Ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of my pet peeves about the translation of these words into English. You will hear, you, you will read and hear and so on. People translate the word Abd as servant, which is servants of Allah. Right? But you know, and I know enough Arabic to know the word for servant is not Abd. The word for servant is Khadib. If you don't believe me, go to an Arab and call him Ya Abd. You know, he, will, he will take you to hospital after that. Seriously, because they know, they understand Arabic. You call him, yeah, he'll smash your face because he'll say, me, I'm, I'm not an Ab. What Ab? Now, what is the It's not a matter of semantics. Understand this. It's not, I'm not playing with, with words. Who's a servant? A servant is an employee. Yes? Servant is an employee. So, the employee-employer relationship means what? Means the servant, first of all, chooses to be a servant. You know, I choose to come and get employed by you. I remain employed by you. I remain in your employment as long as I want. I can resign and walk away. I can go to some other employer. And as far as you are concerned, you are only responsible for paying me my salary on time. That's it, period. Yes or no? Nothing more. But what about a slave? A slave is owned by the person, by his master. What is the meaning of owned? Owned means the slave has no choice. He can't go anywhere. The master owns him. He is not there by choice. He is not choosing to be there. He owns the, he belongs to the master. And what about the relationship, the slave-master relationship? To what extent is the master responsible for the slave? Complete extent. Everything. Said, unsaid, good, bad, every single thing. Whatever is the requirement of the slave, the master is responsible. Think about this. We don't, we don't usually think of our pets as slaves, but effectively we own them, right? What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say about the lady who owned this cat and this cat, this lady confined the cat where the cat couldn't go and feed for itself and the cat had no food and the cat died. What did he say? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah will put her into Jahannam for that. Why? It's a cat after all. Now what about the Rab who will put this woman into Jahannam because she didn't look after a cat? What do you think she will do with you and me? What do you think Allah will do with you and me? Because we own, we are owned by him. The issue is, does the slave understand himself to be a slave? So what is the responsibility of the slave? To do whatever the master wants. That's it. The slave does not have a will of his or her own. So if the master says to the slave, what do you want? What is the ideal slave? What will he say? He will say whatever you want. That's it. What do you need? You know what I need. I don't need to tell you. Because it is your problem, within quotes. I mean, I'm not saying the word problem with regard to Allah. I'm saying, but the owner's issue is the welfare of the slave. So when we say we should become Ibadullah, we are Ibadullah, it's not a question of becoming, but I'm saying we must be aware of that. When we become aware of that, then we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of all that he has given us. And then we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love for Allah is expressed by obedience to Allah. Love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is expressed by following his blessed sunnah. Not by sing, singing anashid or by having this celebration or that celebration. No. By all means, sing, sing anashid if you like. There's no problem. I'm not saying it's haram. I'm saying that is not an expression of the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By all means, sing the anashid. But... If your life is not and my life is not on the sunnah of Muhammad 
then the nashid will not save us similarly we can talk till the cows come home about how much we love allah but if we are not obeying allah subhanahu wa taala all of these claims are of no use the place these two things come together obedience to allah and following the sunnah of muhammad sallam where they where and how they come together is allah subhanahu wa taala said qul in kuntum tuhibbun allah fattabi'uni yuhibbukum allah wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wallahu ghafurur rahim allah said say to them who claim to love allah follow make my ittiba follow me do what i do say what i say walk like i walk talk like i talk eat like i eat treat people like i treat people do it not only because of obedience but because you love muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if you do that what will happen you habib allah allah will love you wallahu ghafur rahim and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the is all forgiving and most merciful my brothers and sisters i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu to be pleased with you i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the coming year the best year of your lives i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable you to do all the things that please him i ask allah to open the doors of rahma and baraka and maghfira for you i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from all evil that you know and that which you don't know i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease all your difficulties those you ask about and those you don't ask about i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you everything you ask with khair and afia and to give you from his majesty and grace and generosity that which you did not ask wa sallallahu ala nabiyil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatihi